That's my mum. Anyone here ever listen to what their mum told them to do? Anyone ever do what their mum told them to do? I rarely did. But what my mum said to me was, one day she handed me a newspaper, a headline which said, here we have a huge change. And that change is China entering the United Nations. 1971, I had just turned 14 years of age, and she handed me this headline. And she said, understand this, learn this, because it's going to affect your future. So being a very good student of history, I decided that the best thing for me to do was, in fact, to go off and learn Chinese. Several decades ago, when you were still a Xiaolu, not a lot, when you were young, you were in China, and you met some Chinese like political and business leaders. And now you met a new generation of Chinese business leaders. What do you see in these Chinese entrepreneurs? What I discover in China each time I go is um, a greater sense of um, creativity. And that is uh, young entrepreneurs, middle-aged entrepreneurs, thinking in new ways about how to build a business. It's not just about technology. It's not just about uh, new innovations. It's also about how you deliver services uh, to the Chinese domestic uh, market and then to the international market. So this is a good development. It takes quite a lot of time. But I think China's making some progress. But it's important for these young entrepreneurs to also understand what the global market is like. Um, and it's sometimes quite different to the Chinese domestic market. Mm -hmm. uh, back to like 30 years ago, we cannot imagine a Chinese businessman to speak on the international stage. But now we have like Jack Ma and others. Uh, you and Jack Ma are good friends. So what do you talk about really when you are together with him? Does he advise your daughter on how to business? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, well, I think uh, Jack Ma has done a great job in building uh, a business out of nothing. It takes a lot of enterprise to have nothing and then to build something and then to build something very big. And that's why I appreciate um, Jack's work. Also, he's a, a human being. He tells a story about when he first learned to speak English and he had a pen friend in Australia. Um, and so he went and stayed with his pen friend, I think, for several months in Newcastle. Um, and that really helped him with his English. But the interesting thing is that since that time, every year, uh, Jack invites that man's family uh, to Hangzhou for a week's holiday. Mm -hmm. And he's done that ever since he's had the money to do it. Yeah. So I think that displays a very good set of Confucian values. And now he has a scholarship dedicated to the family, yeah. um, named Dai Bai's family. Uh, I know your daughter is doing business in China. When mm. he went there, uh, do you give her advice on how to do business, what to do to her? No, absolutely not, because um, I'm not a businessman. Um, and my wife is. Uh, she's very smart, much smarter than I am. And she has uh, developed a business uh, since she was um, uh, in her 20s. So my wife and my daughter, they talk business all the time. And my wife has spent a long time living in China. So, so the secret of the brains in our family is the women, okay? not the guys like me. In terms of how to deal with Chinese people, what do you tell? Because I, I saw your daughter is doing very good in China, actually, so maybe she learned something from you. No, she does it all herself. I've never approved a single script of hers. Uh, in dealing with Chinese people, I mean, our simple approach as a family has always been just be very friendly, very polite, and just be honest, which is, we're good at this, this product is fine, this uh, approach is okay, this policy is a good policy in the case of governments. Because trust is a very rare thing and you cannot abuse trust. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I've ever said to my daughter is, you must look after your customers mm -hmm. because they put some trust in you and therefore you've got to ret return that trust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I know you're a good biker. You ride a free goods yeah, yeah. back in like 1984. Yeah, I always had my own flying pigeon. And, uh, and uh, the flying pigeons were very good. 
very simple, yeah. but nothing could ever destroy them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At that time, flight pigeon is still a luxury in China, but now you can see bicycles, like sharing bicycles everywhere. So China witnessed a lot of changes. What do you think is the most significant change? I think one of the smartest things that the Beijing municipal government has done is the bicycle system recently. What's Beijing got as a big advantage? It's flat. And so you can get around the city on a bike pretty easily. And so what I've noticed is this big phase, which is when I first went to Beijing in 1984, everyone rode bicycles. And then uh, when I went back to China as Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, the Member of Parliament, practically nobody rode bicycles anymore. And now the bicycles are coming back. So for the environment, it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. So you're witnessing the, the biggest change in China is that so? Well, the Chinese people have worked out that you cannot just exploit the environment uh, without uh, consequences. And the government and the people have worked out that if you do that, then it just is, destroys people's health. So you see a range of measures from climate change to cleaning up river systems and these sort of measures, uh, bicycles. Because, uh, and the move to electric cars will be very important as well. If everyone in China was to own a, um, a petroleum-based motor vehicle, 1.4 billion of them, uh, frankly, I think you'd strangle China to death. And so moving to electric cars, bicycles, these sorts of practical measures, I think is the way to go. You see that bloke? He's French. His name is Napoleon. A couple of hundred years ago, he made this extraordinary projection. China is a sleeping lion, and when she awakes, the world will shake. China is today not just woken up, China has stood up and China is on the march and the question for us all is where will China go and how do we engage this giant of the 21st century? If you start looking at the numbers, they start to confront you in a big way. It's projected that China will become, by whichever measure, PPP, market exchange rates, the largest economy in the world over the course of the decade ahead. They're already the largest trading nation, already the largest exporting nation, already the largest manufacturing nation, and they're also the biggest emitters of carbon in the world. You once said that there is always something new to learn about China. What's mm. your latest new thoughts on China? I think my latest new thoughts on, um, on China is to see more and more evidence of um, China's self-confidence in the world. You read books about it and you read articles about it, but if you know as many Chinese people as I do, self-confidence, mm -hmm. uh, And I see this uh, in people's individual behavior, their corporate behavior, mm -hmm. the political behavior of the Chinese government and state. So I think what I see most is this growing self-confidence as China having opened the doors in 1978, mm -hmm. having reformed the economy through the 80s and 90s, and then having zhou uh, chu after that. Um, and then 10 or 15 years after zhou chu chu, there is a increasing level of maturity about uh, China's understanding of the world. It's not perfect, but what I see is a greater, more mature reflection of what the world is like and a greater sense of comfort in working in the world. Mm -hmm. Like in your job, you wouldn't be doing this in New York 20 years ago, would you? True. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're an example of this. But what do you think the confidence come from? Because for a long time, Western scholars always think that Chinese people regard themselves as a victim instead of their competent uh, in the war stage. The, um, I think... Um, Is it because of economy or culture or something else? Well, I think um, one of the good things about Chinese culture is you have this whole emphasis on uh, qian xu, uh, modesty mm -hmm. and humility. Uh, this is not often the biggest strength in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, I know that, and hopefully the Americans won't hear this, so that'll be fine. <laughs> But the great advantage that uh, China has, I think there is an instinctive modesty about the, uh, the culture and about behavior. And, 
and deferring to people. Uh, I think this is a good thing. Secondly, um, I think uh, that is a good skill for understanding the world. If you go out into the world and your attitude is purely by you know, that doesn't help understand the world. You just create enemies that way. And so I think uh, learning to take your time and to patiently understand uh, the world uh, is a very fruitful exercise, although it takes time. The third thing is just a very practical thing, which is the doors were shut for a long time, and then they opened. Uh, and now tens of millions of Chinese have gone out into the world, probably now hundreds of millions, I'm not sure, uh, either short term or long term. So the world is less of a mystery to the people of China. Uh, and then, of course, there's the point that you referred to, which is that China is now wealthier uh, and is a country more powerful. Mm -hmm. The Chinese reformers of the late Qing dynasty dreamt of wealth and power. Uh, if you look at the traditional reformers uh, of uh, Yan Fu and Tan Zi Tong and um, Liang Qichao, and that whole period, mm -hmm. even Kang Yo Wei, in the 1890s, prior to the Xinhai Geming, they always dreamt of how China could obtain wealth and power to deal with the young ren. Um, you know, mm -hmm. So that was in the 1890s. A hundred years later, wealth and power has arrived. Uh, and so I think Chinese people sense that, and that also enables them to be more confident in the world. Mm -hmm. Even though, uh, as you know and I know, China still has stacks of problems. Chinese leadership knows that as well. You travel to China a lot of times, and mm. now you live in New York, so you know China, you know US very well. Uh, in the past, we have a lot of like people who work on the China-US relationship very mm. well, like Dr. Kissinger, like Mr. Paulson. Mm. Uh, what did you learn from their experience? I think um, with Henry Kissinger, who I know very well, uh, what uh, Henry has concluded a long time ago is first, a country as old as China does not change its fundamental views of the world quickly or easily. I mean, you've had uh, a philosophical system and a system of language which is now, you know, 4,000 years old, three to 4,000 years old. And so, as a result, you have a deeply entrenched view of the world and a view of yourself. Um, there are no other countries like that. Mm -hmm. There are no other countries which are big modern countries, which are simultaneously ancient countries. Perhaps Iran or Persia comes closest in terms of continuity. So that's the one thing which uh, Henry um, uh, emphasizes. I think the second thing is if you're going to try and help US-China relations, it's best to do it quietly. It's a very good principle. It's very easy in politics and in international relations to that, I think, is a very uh, clever approach uh, from Henry. As for Hank, who I know as well, and so he has um, had a different perspective to Henry's, who has always been a foreign policy national security guy. But what Hank has seen is the evolution of the Chinese entrepreneurial mind. And so he is constantly encouraged by what um, China has achieved in its economy. And so uh, I listen to both of them a lot, and I, I'm privileged to count both of them as friends. Mm -hmm. uh, just now you mentioned uh, uh, Paulson's difference uh, from Dr. Kissinger. What's your difference from them two? I'm an Australian. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty obvious difference. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I have no illusions about... Uh, you know, my importance in the world. Um, at, the end of the at the end of the day, I am a former Prime Minister of uh, one G20 country. These guys were respectively Secretary of State and Secretary of the Treasury for the largest country in the world. And so these guys carry a lot of influence. So um, 
uh, I don't uh, see myself in their league at all. You once joke about Australians are good at uh, bringing the drinks. You provide a suggestion, go and get a drink. <laughs> Just as you mentioned, China has a long history, and the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world. So how do you make sure that your suggestions are more likely to be taken and more operational? Well, at the end of the day, you can't guarantee that because governments are governments. I, uh, I have run my own government in the past, and governments um, ultimately make up their own minds. I think the key to successfully advising a government uh, is to explain carefully your understanding of the interests of China and the interests of the United States. The interests of China as seen through Chinese eyes, but interestingly, the interests of China as seen through American eyes. And sometimes they're not the same thing. And by the same logic, uh, it's uh, important to explain uh, to uh, the Chinese American interests as the Americans see them. So I think half the battle is in removing this problem of perceptions. Uh, some of them are objective difficulties, where it's not a problem of language and culture. I agree with you that um, you are in a great place to talk to both sides, in a way. But you're Sometimes. Not <laughs> <laughs> but you're not a Chinese, not America. So you can see it. <laughs> have you ever come across a situation where you have like an outsider dilemma or like a trust crisis? The outsider dilemma. Well, Australians generally have an outsider dilemma because we're the only Western country in Asia. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we're kind of used to this outsider dilemma. Well, there's New Zealand too. Um, but um, as a result, uh, we're used to being the odd man out or the odd man in. Uh, if you know what I mean. I think the key, uh, there's one advantage in being an Australian uh, in Asia relative to other Westerners. And that is in our region, the Asia Pacific region, uh, we recognize the fact that there are much bigger, uh, more powerful, and certainly more ancient cultures and civilizations than ours. Therefore, that places a burden of responsibility on us to understand these other cultures, to understand China from the inside, to understand Japan from the inside, as opposed to just thinking that these are expressions of uh, Western thinking. The West is a relatively new idea, last 500 years. Most of these cultures and civilizations have been around for 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 plus. So, um, as Australians, uh, I can't say that we are naturally chin shu, but we understand that we are new kids on the block, and we understand that we are smaller kids on the block. So therefore, we make it our business to understand great powers, whether it's the Americans or you guys. So does that give us an advantage? Sometimes. Is that an outsider's dilemma? I think it's an outsider's advantage, actually. Let's talk about an individual case. For example, recently Donald Trump calls for China IP review and yeah. may God the Chinese response. On this case, what do you think? What, what did you do? What are you going to do to help the two? Well, the Trump presidency is uh, unique. Mm -hmm. Do we or other? I haven't seen one like it. <laughs> I don't think the American people have either and probably not the Chinese people. Secondly, it's a deeply protectionist government. Uh, and they said that before they were elected. They're going to protect American industry against uh, foreign firms, particularly Chinese firms. And since the election, they've done that. They announced the abolition of the TPP before they even started. And now they're beginning to take measures against China. So what can be done about it by people like us? Um, the argument I always put is never forget, all of us, how we have benefited from open trade and open investment rules. Asia, including China, 30 years ago, while not poor, was certainly not rich. 
the big thing that's changed it is the whole wealth that has come through open trade and investment between the countries of the region and between the region and the United States, between the region and Europe. So people often forget this, that uh, in decades past, uh, our part of the world was not all that prosperous. But it's prosperous now because of open lines of commerce and investment and trade and business uh, and technology flows and capital flows. So that's the first thing we emphasize, which is and the second thing we emphasize is it's very easy to trigger a trade war, which becomes an investment war, which becomes an economic war. And once you do that, our collective wealth collapses. So what we try to do is just to emphasize these two basic truths in our dealings with uh, the Chinese um, and, with, uh, and with the Americans. Uh, will we have an effect or not? I do not know. Um, because, um, as I said, this is a unique presidency. Mm. So do you think a protectionism or populism is only a short-term phenomenon or a beginning of a major, like, larger global trend? My attitude is um, not one of making broad predictions, uh, partly because I'm still, if you like, a political activist, which is I want to see changes in a positive direction. And so I believe it lies within the grasp of the Chinese government, the European governments, and the government of the United States to make uh, the right decisions for the future, to keep economies open, to keep societies open, to keep markets open. Uh, will they have the political resolve to do that? Well, that's the reason Macron was elected. And that's a reason why um, the far-right parties in the Netherlands uh, were not elected. So, and that's why the far-right parties even in Britain at the last general election failed. In uh, the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP. So you see, it's not just one trend towards protectionism. Um, it's a very mixed trend. If you look at the opinion polling in Europe, it's fascinating. 77% yeah. uh, yeah, of Europeans want to remain within the European Union. No, 77. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so the whole idea that concerns about cultural identity mm -hmm. and protecting your culture equals closing the doors to global trade and investment mm. is a false equation. Mm. Uh, in Europe, if you look at the opinion poll data carefully, it's a media chart,很清楚呢。一部分的那些因素都是，we it's a complex question. I think if policymakers can recognize the difference, uh, we can protect our cultures. That's fine. Um, but understand that our collective wealth lies still with a globalizing economy. The future of US-China relations? The head says there's a way forward. The head says there is a policy framework, there's a common narrative, there's a mechanism through regular summary to do these things and to make them better. But the heart must also find a way to reimagine the possibilities of the America-China relationship and the possibilities of China's future engagement in the world. Sometimes, folks, we just need to take a leap of faith, not quite knowing where we might land. Is that your mission or your core value? No, I think if I've got a core mission or a core value, it's how can you um, bring about a set of circumstances where political leaders around the world change their thinking about the inevitability of conflict? because in the back of the mind of most political leaders is a view that history teaches us that conflict is inevitable. So how can you change that? And that for me is a question of deep national psychology. Um, so my mission is how do you explain at a practical level how you can avoid conflict, but also through the evolution of what I describe as common values, which uh, transcend uh, all civilizational traditions, all religious traditions, traditions, which reminds us that we're just all human beings.
By the way, if you cut that, I bleed the same as you. <laughs> 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 